Hello everyone and welcome to my channel. My name is Kalika and you're gonna be a craftier person after watching this video. Just do what I say. Sure will. During university, I used to work a lot of odd jobs to help pay for tuition. One job I had was to be an assistant for a faculty member that was a typical Karen. The job was supposed to be only admin tasks related to schoolwork, but I helped her with other tasks to pad my hours. Such as help her move things to and from a storage locker, helping buy and move furniture and things like that. Everything had to be done her way or else I would have to go back and redo it. At the end of the week I would draft an email about the tasks I did and send it to the work study program, CC Karen and get her to sign off on what I did. I don't think anyone read the body of the email or even cared. As long as Karen signed off on how many hours I work, I got paid. 10 days before my contract ended, Karen buys a brand new car right off the lot. This car had keyless entry and start, and 7 years ago this was uncommon and not many people around campus had it. During the last 5 days of my contract, Karen decided that she was going to get the most out of my labour. I stacked up at least 20 hours of work during finals. This was great for cash, but not so great for studying. Most of the tasks she had me do were to her new car. I am decently mechanically inclined and enjoy working on cars and motorcycles. Karen knew this and would have me do things for her new car, like installing a spoiler she brought off eBay, putting fender flares on, etc. The last day I was scheduled to work for her was devoted to working on this car. The last task she had for me was to install a spare hide a key box underneath her car and put a spare key in it. In a keyless entry car. I explained to her many, many times that by putting the car's key fob on the car would mean that anyone can open and drive it. She was furious that I fought her on installing the hide a key and argued with me in the school's parking lot for just about an hour. She argued that if she forgot her key she would be stranded and that she always had a spare key on all of her cars. I was adamant about not installing it until she threatened to not sign off on my hours and to just do what I say. Sure. I installed the key box and put her spare in it, got her to sign off on my last email and was very explicit with installing the key box, even saying in the email that I was against it, had concerns about the car and felt that I had to install it or she would not sign off on my hours. No fuss, no muss. I get paid the next day and complete the exit packet. I leave for break and when I come back, the work study program director calls me in for a sit down to talk about my work with Karen. Sure enough, her car was stolen only a week after break and I was being asked if I had anything to do with it. I told them to pull up my emails that I sent with my weekly reports and in the last one I had on my report on installing the keybox and how against it I was. Luckily I was back home for the break with family, working as a server for a pizza joint and was nowhere near my university. Unlucky for Karen, she never mentioned it in the police report that she had put the keyless fob on the outside of her car. After graduating three years later, I found out from some peers that she was never able to recover her car. I feel like this is definitely a case of play stupid games, win stupid prizes. Okay Mr. Lawyer, I will. TLDR, lawyer tried to hardball my client. I proved his client committed a statutory offence and got what I wanted plus damages and dobbed his client in. So, I work as a specialist property valuer. A few years ago, a real estate agent friend approached me on behalf of his client. His client was a bookseller who operated a specialist bookshop on the 7th floor of a city building. A one-man band, small business, nice bloke. Unfortunately, nice bloke had decided to renew his lease for 5 years and signed the new lease without getting advice. His new building owner enacted the market rent review clause and jacked up his rent by something like 50%. Tells Nice Bloke, your new rent for the next 5 years is X amount. Nice Bloke is distraught, he can't afford it, so he asks Nicely to rescind the lease and he will move elsewhere. A state agent friend has found a cheaper space for him. Denied by the building owner. Building owner says he will also sue if he breaks the lease. So the agent asked me to review the case. I look through the case. Nice Bloke is stuffed. The lease is locked tight and they are justified in jacking up the rent. I think our only hope is to appeal to the mercy of the building owner's lawyer. So I call him and ask for a release, penalty free, for my client. Mr. Lawyer says, Stiff cheddar, you need to comply with the law, try reading the lease. A real arrogant a-hole. Cue malicious compliance. Okay, I will. I read through the lease and note that all references to the Retail Leases Act have been crossed out. Fair enough. The act only applies to retail tenancies if they are below the third floor of a building. Nice bloke is on level 7. Act should not apply. But hold up. I'm going to check on that. 
I called a small business commission who administered the act and they advised that if you retail a good, like books, it doesn't matter what floor you're on, the act applies. You could be on the friggin' roof if you want. The level 3 provision only applies if you retail a service. This means the building owner has breached the act and failed to comply with the law. There are certain things they have to provide before signing a lease and timing they have to follow. A breach is no small thing. I get a ruling from the commission. I call for mediation with Mr. Lawyer, present are Mr. Lawyer, building owner and their agent and nice bloke and me. I again plead for a penalty free release, no dice and they threaten to sue. I gently slide the ruling across the table to Mr. Lawyer. Okay, well as per your suggestion, I read the lease. We have a ruling that proves the act applies to the lease. Your clients failed to comply with the act and committed a statutory offence. The lawyer reads the ruling. Um, okay, we'll grant you a penalty free release. Oh, we don't need that. We enact our right under the act to terminate the lease, penalty free, and to seek damages for the landlord's breach of their statutory obligations, and I'll be reporting the breach to the commission. No need for all that, let's just tear up the lease. Sorry, that wouldn't be complying with the law, would it? Update 1. I just spoke with the agent on our side, we're still good mates, he can't remember the outcome off the top of his head, but he thinks he might have leveraged a waiver of nice blokes make good obligations, requirement to replace carpets, paint walls and remove fit out etc. And he did move nice bloke to a cheaper space. He thinks he might still have a file on it, so he'll ring me back when he gets into the office. Update 2. So I spoke to the agent today and he doesn't have the file anymore, but his recollection is that he negotiated a waiver on the make good obligations, got 60 or 90 days rent free and relocation as a deal for nice bloke. We can't remember if anything happened from the Dobbin. Enjoy the coffee! I work as a technician for an office coffee company. My main job is to install and fix equipment, but I also get the fun task of repoing equipment to people that don't honour their contract. We had one account that was just a complete pain in the butt. They would never clean the machines or do the basics to keep it running, like fill the thing up, and they were always very rude to us. One day, I go to that customer because the machine wasn't working and the drinks were all watery. I get there and it turns out that they didn't bother to open the machine and fill it. Obviously it's watery, there's no coffee or anything in the canisters. So I asked the lady in charge of that dealership if she checked the product because the machine was empty and she tells me to fill the machine and said, just do your job and stop asking questions. So I did it for them, even though my job is to fix the machines when it breaks, not fill it with coffee for them, and kind of sadly and upset go back to the office. I hate being treated like dirt. Fast forward a week and my boss says, I got something that'll make your day. That customer hasn't been paying or returning emails, go repo the coffee equipment. Cue malicious compliance. I go to the customer and tell a tech at the dealership that I'm here to pick up equipment. The dude was cool and said, okay. And I went straight to the equipment, cut the water lines and tossed everything in my van. As I was about to leave, the manager comes out and yells at me asking what the hell I thought I was doing. I replied, doing my job and not asking questions and left. One of the most satisfying days of my life. Deny my request to move from hourly to salary, then dump all this extra work on me? Cool, thanks for the extra paycheck. TLDR is basically the title. Years ago, I worked as the sole hourly employee on a team with salaried workers. This designation had been a mistake on my initial contract, and my cool boss said she would switch me to salary just as soon as my first year contract was up. Unfortunately for me, just before my anniversary, my cool boss left and a witchy co-worker got promoted. Request denied. No reason given other than, I don't think it's necessary. A few weeks later we had this event that had been planned by the cool boss, but since she left the company it fell to new witchy boss and the rest of us workers to staff it. The location for this event was nearly an hour away from the office. Everyone else could just show up to the location, but being early I had to first go into the office, clock in, then drive an hour. Oh well. I guess I get paid for travel time. The night before the event we had hired a set building team to put everything together, but someone from our company had to stay until they're finished, per contract with the location. Witchy boss decided to make me stay as I was her least favourite, so the rest of the team left and went home. Well, there were major issues with the set, and by 10pm it was just me and the one set builder left in the place as he was trying to make the thing work. Set builder didn't care as he was making a ton of overtime. And besides, this particular configuration had been 100% his idea, so he was determined to solve it. I decided I didn't care, because I'd find some cushions to sleep on. 
I ended up dozing from about 11pm to 5am when he finally finished and we could leave. I then drove an hour to the office, clocked out and went home, which was thankfully a short drive. I had an hour to shower, change and go back to the office to clock in, then drive an hour to meet everyone back at the location at 8am. We then worked the event with Witchy Boss again assigning me to stay later than her to supervise breakdown. So, in a 36 hour window, I ended up being on the clock for 33 of those hours. Monday morning, Witchy Boss has to approve and submit payroll, and only then does she realise that she has to pay me time and a half for those 33 hours. She actually had the gall to be mad at me for not warning her about all the overtime, which made me laugh as I explained. I didn't think that was necessary since it was your idea to keep me early, boss. Updates and answers to frequently asked questions. For those asking, here is the explanation of why I wanted to be salaried instead of hourly. At this job, salaried workers had a lot more freedom than hourly employees. For example, salaried didn't have to clock in or out, so if traffic was bad coming back from lunch or if they had to leave a little early for a dentist appointment, it was no problem. As an hourly employee, if I was even one minute off from my designated hours of 8am to 5pm with a 60 minute break, I was in trouble. Have to leave early for a dentist appointment? I would have to put in a time off request and wait for it to be approved before I could take the appointment and my hours and pay would be docked that week, unless I used vacation time, for the time I was gone. It was just very annoying to be the only person in my department who had to jump through so many hoops every day. The aftermath for those asking. Nothing major changed for me immediately after that, and I didn't get fired. That many overtime hours did raise several red flags from her boss in the accounting department. She got majorly scolded but essentially forgiven as she was a brand new boss. I had already been looking for other jobs, so by the time my contract was ending, I was able to walk out. For those interested, the story on how I left is, less than six months later, I was sitting in a review and contract renewal meeting with Witchy Boss and her boss. As yet another power move, I had been trying to schedule this meeting for weeks, but Witchy Boss decided it was just too busy and I had to wait until the very last day of my contract. I'd been keeping my department afloat, plus assisting with two other departments who had people out on various medical leaves, meeting all deadlines while maintaining zero minutes of overtime and 40 hours a week, which impressed the hell out of everyone, but witchy boss. I asked for a small raise and to be made salary with my new contract. Witchy boss doesn't even blink, immediately denies my raise and requests to switch to salary. So I smile, and whip out my letter of resignation stating that I would be leaving at the end of my contract which was ending at that day at 5pm on the dot. And I whipped out an offer letter for my new job with a starting salary $12,000 more. She looked shocked. Her boss looked a little pale. And I stood up, shook their hands, thanked them profusely for their time and walked out the door to start packing up my stuff. In the end, I left on excellent terms with everyone but her. Those other departments I was helping? I helped them remotely for a hefty consulting fee until they were restaffed even after starting my other job. I offered to do the same for my department, but Witchy Boss assured her boss that she could get someone in there quickly to fill my shoes. It took three months to find someone qualified. They left after four months of working under Witchy Boss, and then the company closed that position entirely and Witchy Boss had to beg other departments for assistance on a project by project basis. Less than two years after I left, the revolving door of people due to Witchy Boss's mismanagement caused the entire department to shut down. Everyone there at the time was laid off. Sorry for making this post so much longer, but thanks for reading. Okay, so that's all for r slash malicious compliance. I really hope you did enjoy it. As always, if you do want to see more content like this, then please do subscribe. My Twitter, Discord and Patreon links are in my description, and any support is greatly appreciated. And as it's Sunday, I also want to say a massive thank you to my wonderful patrons. Backwards D-Dog Tyler Miller, Jen Burton, Jens Banning, Bo Walker, Princess Kate, Skylar A, Elizabeth Fillmore, Stephen Arnowit, Anonymous, Shigar, Colton, Bruce Reed, James Scanlon, and Dark Amides. Thank you all so much for your support. Mwah. That's for you, but keep up between us, okay? <laughs> Thank you so much for watching.